Happy Sunday. Pardon my throat, I've uh, had a bad throat and bad flu for the past two weeks. First time in my life I had five consecutive nights where I cannot sleep. I will cough through the whole night. But it's in preparation for the sermon today because it got to do with suffering. So <laughs> we are going back to the expository preaching with Exodus and I hope you still remember what was taught the last time. And I believe the Lord will want to give us a wonderful lesson today uh, relating to in the meantime, in the gap between us being called into the presence of God and sanctification. So, in the meantime, this is because it continues with Exodus 4, the last lesson, uh, where we talk about, if you remember, the, the continual encounter of Moses with the burning bush. Uh, one of the lessons in Exodus 3 was how Moses encountered God in the burning bush. And then we talk about how God is the great I am. And in this particular case, chapter 4 continue the encounter where God then told Moses the role that he, he used to have in his life and how he was very resistant. But before the whole thing started, I wanted to remind you that Moses, as Acts 7 pointed out to us, was a person who was instructed in all the wisdoms of the Egyptians and mighty in his words and deeds. In other words, this guy was no ordinary Joe, you know. He was a person who was very, very capable and the best of the best among his generation. And so God called Moses, this person, to him. But by which time Moses was in the desert for already another 40 years. So by that time he was about 80 years old. So he may look like a normal everyday shepherd, but actually his background was, was quite different. Uh, you could say that he would be the... The, the best person you can ever find in the whole generation because he was really trained in all the best things that was available in the world back then because the Egyptians were the top of the entire world at that time. Yet, as we have read in Exodus 4, when God called him, he kept attempting to escape from God's command. Remember, I wanted you to count with me how many times he said no to God. I don't know whether you remember. He said Five times, uh, every time God told him that he got to do this, he will find another excuse, and then God will give him a counter argument, and even another excuse. They keep going on and on and on. It took him like five times, and but in the encounter of Moses and God speaking in the burning bush, we wanted to learn about the attributes of God and that of man. And from the the encounter itself, we learned the first big lesson to learn was that God is a God who is slow to anger, because Moses really was. Uh, I don't know, if I am standing before a burning bush with such a sign and wonder, I wonder if I would be like Moses. The answer would be, must, it must be. Because as I've pointed out to you many times, the story of Moses is not just about this wonderful guy in history. You know? I want you to remember that Moses is a kind of foreshadow for all of us as well. And so don't look at him as just some guy we wanted to learn about in history. But everything that Moses would go through in life really reflect the way we would go through our life as well. And in a sense, definitely, we will always attempt to escape God and to test his patience. And so time after time, Moses said no to God, even though God was speaking to him in a, a wondrous kind of a manner. So there are many side lessons, actually. One of the side lessons is that don't ever think that if God will show you a great miracle, your, your, your faith will jump in leaps and bounds. May not be so, you know. Some people think that, oh, you know, if God will heal me from stage 4 cancer or something like that, then, wow, I will become really close to God and all that. History shows that that's not the case. There are many people who have been shown great grace by God in miraculous manner, doesn't necessarily would then lead to a, a very kind of a pious lifestyle. So, in other words, we are really, really stubborn people and very, very stiff-necked people. However, at the same time, we know that after Moses argued with God like for the fifth time, after the fifth time, the Bible tells us that the anger of God was kindled against Moses. And that's a very simple description in the Bible. We don't know how, what does that mean, right? But I show you a clip from uh, the cartoon Prince of Egypt. How it happened was in the cartoon, uh, the fire suddenly go boom, you know, and it's a really, got really, in Chinese it's called huota, you know, the fire suddenly become very big <laughs> and then Moses was very frightened. So it shows us that actually God's patience does have a limit. So don't make the mistake of thinking that a slow to anger God, in old English it's called long suffering God, will suffer forever, you know. Uh, and also don't, think that the slow to anger of God is kind of a part of God's 
habit. You know, he's just a very slow guy. He's not. It's actually linked with the perfect timing of God and his perfect wisdom. And it so happened that God's timing was not up yet. And so to us, from our anger, he is slow to anger. But he is linked actually to his perfect timing as well. And so at a certain stage where God's timing is up, based on his perfect wisdom again, uh, so he, cannot, he, he will never miss a bit, uh, then there is no more choice for you to bargain anymore. And, and there is no, no way to bargain anymore. Remember what Jonathan Edwards say: When the timing of God is up, uh, you can streak all you want, scream all you want, and cry all you want, and bang your head against the wall all you want, and plead for mercy, you will find none. Because the timing of God is already up. Therefore, man cannot possibly escape God. It's not a possibility. And this is something that we don't quite get. We think we can escape from God and everything relating to God and the truth of God. And you know, the, the longer I've been in this ministry, the more I realize that this is true. We cannot escape God. We cannot escape the truth. Remember the national slogan of India, the truth always triumphs. That's a fascinating slogan. Too bad India is full of corruption, right? But, <laughs> but it's a good slogan. The truth always triumphs. So no matter what you do in life, you may think you are escaping God or escaping your government or escaping the society or your wife or your husband or whatever it is. It doesn't work that way because the great wheel of the truth and the time will keep moving forward and you cannot possibly escape. And so because of that, after the fire becomes very big and then Moses got really freaked out, he started on a lifelong journey of transformation. And as I said to you, this is a reflection of us as well. So will we. We will do the same in our life as well. And so all of us are on a lifelong journey of what is called sanctification. That we will reach a stage where we become like Jesus Christ. But not in this lifetime. So in this lifetime, we become more and more like Jesus Christ. But we actually will never reach it until Christ will come again. But the journey itself is called sanctification. And so all of us, myself included, every single one of you sitting here, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are on a journey of sanctification. And so we will learn from Moses in this journey what will happen to you. But one key lesson, of course, is that the earlier you learn to surrender to God Almighty in this journey of sanctification, the earlier you learn to live a life that God wants you to live and you will enjoy Him forever. The more you resist, the harder you will be and the longer the journey will be for a lot of us. And so herein lies where the wisdom is. The wiser you are, the earlier you surrender to God Almighty, the better it will be for you in the journey. But every one of us will react quite differently and we will look especially at Moses in his journey and learn the lesson to reflect upon our own journey as well. Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer as we enter into Exodus 5. We thank you, O God, for giving us this privilege to come before you in such a calm and safe manner in this very comfortable place to listen to your word. Grant to us a heart that is appreciative of this, humble and teachable, that before you, O God, that we understand that we are nothing, we are but made of dust. Because the Bible tells us that you oppose the proud but give grace to the humble. So help us then to be humble. But we are stiff-necked and stubborn people. So... Help us because we are weak, but we know you are strong. And have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now to go into Exodus 5, we must go to the end of Exodus 4 first. And the Lord said to Aaron, so after the encounter in the burning bush, the next character that come in is Aaron, the brother of Moses. Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. So that was the, like the first time Aaron met his brother. So the Bible is not very important, so it's a very quick kind of description. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Remember the signs. There were like at least three signs two of which was able to be done on the spot. The first one was the staff, the stick that he was holding. If he put the stick on the ground, what would happen? It become a snake. And you hold the tail of the staff, it become a staff again. Then the second sign was a sign of leprosy, which is a kind of very frightening disease for the people of that time. You see that anybody with leprosy, they will freak out and run away 100 meters away because they think leprosy is contagious. So Moses had the ability to put his hand in a cloak, I come out and become leprous, white, 
like snow. I put it back in again, come out, and then it become uh, clear again. And the last time was to turn the water of the Nile into blood, which will happen much later. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. So again, a very short description, but he must have made a long journey back to Egypt to gather all the people together. Verse 30 says, And Aaron spoke all the words of the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. And so the signs are important. Now, we, we, in the Reformed Evangelical Church, we don't talk about signs and wonders so often because we believe that the canonical Bible is already given to us. And so we don't think that God will work signs and wonders unless it is a very, very unusual and very desperate situation. Whereas in the charismatic church, there are signs and wonders day and night. And of course, we don't quite believe that there are signs. Their signs are true signs. But you can imagine that when Moses would approach a people and then go and tell them this story about how God is called him and all that, why would anyone believe in you unless you can show some really spectacular signs? And indeed, the signs were very convincing to the people because they were like, they cannot explain it right. The staff become a snake, hand become leprous. I, I kind of appreciate this a little bit more than others, I suppose. You know, there are preachers who specializes in magic show. <laughs> you know, the one mega church guy who specializes in doing magic show, except that his magic show is quite old-fashioned and not very happening. I know quite a bit of magic tricks myself, you know, because when I was in secondary school, I, had, I joined a club called the Hobbies Club. Except that I was focusing on electronic hobbies. We were making electronic robots and all that. But the Hobbies Club had a magician group, magic trick group. And I thought I better learn some magic trick to impress girls and kind of thing, right? So I did pick up some magic trick. And one of them is a sleight of hand that if you're interested after the worship service, I can show it to you. But it's very difficult to do, but it takes a lot of practices. And you know, Nowadays, I don't use it to impress girls anymore like, because the one got impressed married me already. So anyway, I, I use it to impress the kids, right? And it's always very amazing to watch the kids' eyes light up when you do a magic trick. And then it's like, and, and I had it on video, right? During the gospel rally, I was showing it to Lerler, one of these little toddlers was running around. And somebody was taping me, I didn't know. And it's, it's like, he was looking at it, like, wow! He was like, a, wow! So you can imagine all the Israelites when they watch the thing, they like, wow! <laughs> this big deal thing happening. And for them to then put their trust on Moses and Aaron, it must have been quite a spectacular thing to happen. And so began the ministry of Moses and Aaron on a very high note. He has shown the signs and wonders and people like talking about it day and night and calling their friends and hey, come, 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 let's look at this guy. Like, wow, you know, he's going to do great signs and God has called upon him. And in this ministry, of course, for the rest of the chapters of Exodus, we see Moses as the primary driver and Aaron was his assistant. And those of you who have read the Bible know that Aaron was not a very good assistant. <laughs> Somewhere down the line, he gave up also. Um, but we wanted to focus a lot more on Moses. And so moving on to Exodus 5 then. On a high note, right, these two chaps then went into Egypt and go immediately in front of Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus say the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now remember that I kind of recommended to you to go and watch movie on this one, The Ten Commandments and also The Prince of Egypt and some black and white kind of a thing. You can find all this on YouTube actually. And the reason is because it does give us a feel of how it would have been like. For example, in The Ten Commandments, I'm quite surprised. Ten Commandments, I watch it many times because of this sermon. Of course, watch it since a kid. If you're American, you watch it every year, okay? Because they always play during Easter and uh, Good Friday on, on public television. And it, the film was made in 1956. And surprisingly, even back then, they put in a lot of effort, you know, on the props, on the, uni on, on the costumes, and did a lot of research as to how it was like. So although the Bible says, Moses and Aaron went and said to, Moses, uh, to Pharaoh, if you watch the movie, you will know that it's actually not so simple because the Pharaoh was like the, the biggest deal in the whole land, right? So they had like sort of soldiers and army and big courtyard and you know, and so the movie sort of portrayed that quite well. And Aaron and Moses had to like go through a lot of guards before they came to Pharaoh. But they were very confident. Why? Because they had the signs with them, they had the ability, and God has spoken to them before. It's very high and, and very 
confident of the rightness of their cause because the signs and wonders and the power was with their hands. But the Bible says, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and moreover, I will not let Israel go. The background of this story, of course, is that the Egyptians had many laws, many gods. And the number of gods that the Egyptians have are really numerous because they are polytheistic in nature, meaning to them everything is a god. So here's a picture of some of the more prominent Egyptian gods. I know some of you go and play all these stupid computer games, right? If some of the gods are characters in there. Uh, some of the more famous ones is on the extreme left one is Horus, which is the god of revenge and, and destruction or extreme right is Isis. Isis is a goddess of magic and, and gifts and stuff like that. Many, many years ago, there was this old television show called Almighty Isis, you know, where this, like Wonder Woman, you know, instead of Wonder Woman, it's the Isis woman kind of a thing. Then you have Anubis, which is a, a jackal head kind of a god, uh, the one with the black head, who will guide you into the underworld uh, the one in the middle with the big red sign on top is the most important Egyptian god, Ra, which is the god of what? Who knows? Sun, very good. Well, I hope you know the Bible as well. <laughs> you know Egyptians got very well. A bit worrisome to me. Ra is son of God. It's a big thing. There's a god with a crocodile head and all that. So many, many different gods. So Pharaoh is supposed to be a god king kind of a, a guy. So he would be worshipping all these kind of different gods of all kinds and all shapes and, and sizes. And so for him to suddenly go listen to you and your whatever god is not something that's so easy for him as well. So of course, and uh, the other part of it is that surely I'm not going to let go all my slaves who have been building all these uh, structures for me, uh, all the pyramids and whatever palaces that they have for me. So that was a, like the first objection. And then they said, the God of the Hebrews have met with us. Please let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So both Moses and Aaron tell, tell Pharaoh, okay, please let us go for just three days. Huh? Uh, we can worship our God in the wilderness. Because if we don't, God will strike us dead, okay, with the pestilence and the sword. Now, this particular thing is actually was a test, sort of a test given to Pharaoh because a three-day rest even in the days of Pharaoh, was quite common for different kinds of slaves who have different kinds of customs. Uh, so, of course, the idea of Moses was to deliver the people completely and not just a three-day thing. But it was like a test water thing because if you will not even give a three-day, then forget about lifelong kind of a thing. But from the statement also, we do see Moses' understanding of God was still at a very primitive stage. Moses sort of thought that, you know, if we didn't do this, then God will punish us, right? Because... Man, his anger was kindled against me in a burning bush. And so if we don't go worship him, maybe he'll send me a pestilence, a kind of plague come and kill us all. Or, or some kind of sword will come upon us. Such is the case for a lot of us in the journey of sanctification, isn't it? In the early days of our walk with God, we often would think about God as that very frightening kind of a father in, in heaven. We do something wrong, he's going to strike me dead or he's going to punish me with all kinds of, of things. And our understanding of God is at a very immature stage where we think that God is all about punishment, rewarding good and punishing the bad. But of course, that's the case. But the nature of God and the attribute of God is a lot further than that. But at this stage in time, Moses did not quite get it. And so it will be the case for us in the early stage of our walk with God. And the Bible goes on to say, But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Go back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. On the same day, the thing got worse. Pharaoh commanded the taskmakers of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall still impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Before they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So the situation got worse. That Pharaoh, instead of considering this, 
decided to make the burdens worse for the people to tell them to make straw, make bricks without straw. So making bricks without straw become part of English idiom. Like when you ask your staff to go and do something impossible, the staff will say, hey, you're asking me to make bricks without straw. If your staff say that, that means that guy probably know Christian Bible quite well <laughs> because that's what it means. They have to do the impossible. And to understand this again, you watch the movie Ten Commandments. Hey, how many of you watch it actually? Anybody? Don't have a... Uh, only the people who are a bit elderly and those more quiet ones. Uh, the rest never listen. Go, go and find it in YouTube. You'll get it a lot better. When you watch it in, in, in the movie, you, you will get the gravity of what this means. Because in a movie, they actually they spend quite a bit of time on this brick without straw kind of thing. And this is a screen, screen grab of what it, it means. You may not be able to see quite well. Right? So this is an Egyptian guy in the middle. And it's like a pit thing, like mud pit. And what happened is that there are people inside the mud pit that was just like walking, you know. I mean, stomping and stomping and stomping. And there are other slaves that are around who are bringing a lot of straws to the mud pit. Then one old guy was like chopping the straws into smaller, smaller pieces and dumping it into the mud pit. And a lot of slaves were like walking and walking and walking and stomping and stomping and stomping on the mud pit. And then some other slave would scoop up the mud that is now mixed with straw and put it in this kind of tray and bake it in the sun. And that's how you make bricks with straws. And it was a very sad kind of a thing because when... This guy is Moses like, in the show. So in the show, the Moses was put in there. He was asking this old man, very old guy. He said, hey, uh, old man, why are you, how long have you been doing this? The old man said, we have been walking on the mud pit for 400 years. 400 years, you know. So that's how tough the, the whole thing is. So when Pharaoh said that you shall have no bread, no straw, what it meant is that then the people have to go and find straw for themselves. Go and pick up whatever piece of straw from their house or from anywhere else and in order to make the bricks. Because without straw, the mud brick will not hold. It's just like cement and sand. Uh. Without sand, the cement block will not hold as well. And so the burden became very, very bad. And the situation was terrible. And, and so the first thing that happened was this opposition from the outside appear in the ministry of Moses and Aaron. And the opposition came from Pharaoh in a very spectacular and horrifying manner. And you know, when I was preparing for the sermon, I wanted to focus a lot more on the suffering part. But I did not proceed forward because I find it very difficult to talk about it or to preach about it. Because although the Bible put it in a very quick manner, making bricks without straw, the reality was that it was a terrible, terrible time for the Israelites. And the Israelites did not only suffer because there was brick without straw. The suffering was with them for 400 over years. And it's not something that is very easy to preach about or easy to understand or explain. And so the movie sort of bring part of that kind of desperation out for them. I mean, for us, people like us, we sit here so comfortably and we're enjoying aircon and listening to the pastor and trying not to fall asleep or whatever it is. It, it seems like a chore sometimes to come to church, right? But can you imagine you're one of these people who have been suffering for generations under slavery and then the Egyptian kind of whip you, all, all, all kind of things. And in the movie, it was quite interesting because Moses sort of mixed into the group of people and one of the women that came with the water gave him water and said, you are not one of us. And Moses said, how do you know? She said, because your back has no scars. You know, because you, you have never been whipped before. Your back has no scars. And so you are from the outside world. And so that sort of depicts to you how terrifying the situation is. And the suffering of the people of God from the opposition, from the outside, is not something that is easy to comprehend. And actually, it's very frightening even for me to think about. In the second response, in your focal verses that Brother Hardy read for us, Romans chapter 8 says that since creation, all of the world has been groaning in child pain. And, and the world continues to groan and moan in pain in many manners because there's great opposition from the outside to the work of God. And when I think about the suffering of the world, there are a couple of suffering that I feel are equivalent, if not worse, than the suffering the Israelites had under the Egyptian. One of the most horrifying ones in recent history must be the Holocaust, which is something which I must admit to you that I don't understand. Because the Jews were 
slaughtered systematically by the Nazi Germans, and up to about 6 million people were killed in World War II. And this is something which is really quite incomprehensible, except when you look at the pictures of the Holocaust, and if you ever visit a Holocaust museum, the gravity of the situation will come in quite deeply. Uh, we talk about suffering of the people we know in our life. A couple of people will be suffering because of illnesses or whatever catastrophe or dysfunctionality in their family. Or well, you're talking about six million people here, you know, and it's very incomprehensible how God would allow opposition to Him to be in such an extent. And it 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 is something that I find most difficult to comprehend. And you know, when I was researching. For this, I came across this thing that was really sick and, and sad. There's this artist guy who is in Germany. He's a German Jew, actually. He actually started a website called the YOLO Cost. You know, Holocaust and the YOLO Cost. Change the H to Y, YOLO. You know, the millennium say YOLO. You, you are. You only live once, YOLO Cost. Because he found that in the internet, there were many people who went to visit Museum of the Holocaust and took a lot of selfies uh, in there. It's because in a Holocaust Museum, those of you who have been there know, you have a lot of life-size photograph to help you understand the horror of it all. So sometimes a life-size photograph will show all these people who are really skinny or lying in bunkers or inside a, a, a kind of a train cut. Uh, the one I visited have a real train cut inside to show you how it was like to be trapped inside there. And in your course, he had a lot of pictures of people who would stand beside them and do this, you know, you know, you know selfie. People do selfie and put their face inside of all the... I picked the one that is not so horrifying for you, you know. There were some where, like, the men are, like, almost naked and, like, like, like stick and bone and, like, skeletal looking. And people would go there and... <laughs> and, and do this selfie thing. And so his Yolo Cost website collected all the pictures that he gleaned from the various Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or wherever it is to show you that there are people who don't quite get it. You don't get it. At the end of the day, it's all about you, you know. It's all about me because I visit the museum, so I must go and do a selfie it, even though the picture actually depicts such a horrifying part of the world. And so it's a very scary thing to think about humanity and our ignorance as well. And so other than Holocaust, closer to home in recent uh, years have been the ISIS opposition to Christianity. And we see all kinds of things going on, beheading, mass killing, and, and all sorts of things. This is a picture of the ISIS slaughtering a whole village of Christians by firing at them in a in a pit that they make them and dig. And so all this kind of suffering really is part of the kind of opposition that comes from the outside world that the Israelites have suffered during their time and it continues to come to us. And the closest and closest to us recently will be the case of our brother Reverend Wang Yi and his wife and his church in Chengdu. And as you know, as I've announced to you before, the entire church has been arrested and we don't know where our, our uh, dear co-worker, Reverend Wang Yi and his wife, is right now. We do know that he is being charged with sedition, which is a charge that will bring uh, a life sentence in hard labor. And so we have been praying earnestly for him. And it's very difficult, actually, to think or even imagine what sort of suffering there can be when you proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in your life. And Wang Yi, the Reverend Wang Yi, as I've shared with you before, is really one of the people I respect greatly in, in my lifetime for his sheer power of intellect and also his great faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And to, till today, you know, he has been arrested for almost a month. We have no idea where he is. There's no clue whatsoever. And so as Moses and Aaron went forth on an emotional high to start his ministry, immediately opposition from the outside Occur. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you must know that God's word will surely, absolutely, definitely be opposed by many different factors. First of all, God's word will be opposed by Satan. And that's for sure. In a Reformed Evangelical Church, we don't talk about Satan so often. Dr. Stephen Tong actually told me that he don't like to mention the word Satan from the pulpit because he said he don't want to give space to Satan. So he tried not to use the word Satan. 
but it is a reality in the Bible, isn't it? From the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 3, 14, the Lord God said to the serpent after the fall of man, that I will put enmity between you and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. Note that it's singular, you know, offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so this verse itself is a prophecy as to how the world will carry on. That all of Satan's offsprings or foes or whatever it is will continue to attack the offspring of the woman, which is our Lord Jesus Christ and all the followers of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to be very, very aware that the work of Satan is all around us from the outside. And I say this especially to those of you who are married and all the people who come to me with marriage prep, I keep telling you, you must be aware that Satan is lurking all over you, all around you, especially people of God. Because Satan is not happy that people of God is happy. It's as simple as that. So very often, I say that from experience. Every time you quarrel with your spouse, you look at your spouse's face when you are quarreling, you're very unhappy, right? You look at her and you... Or you can, and for the woman, you look at him. I have to say, I look at her. I say, what is that? She's not gentle. You're not pretty anymore after all this childbirth or whatever it is. I'm not talking about you. I'm just illustration. You know, you know. And so, so rude and so rough and so, so, so horrible and all that kind of thing. You know what will happen next? When you go to work, you will find exactly someone who will appear who is exactly what you say your wife is not. All the men, you mark this. You will find somewhere very gentle, very nice. And what is that? What exactly? What? This is what I'm looking for, man, you know. That's what, this is the work of Satan. If you are not careful, you jump into it and say, well, hang on, someone come already. You know? and, you, you, and I tell you, Satan is lurking behind you somewhere. And when you are aware, then you will say, go behind me, Satan. But of course, don't say that to the girl. Or she'll get upset with you. So it, it's, it's exactly true. And I've seen so many cases in my pastoral work that people that fall into the traps of Satan without knowing it. And that's just a very simple simplistic illustration, you know. Satan is not that stupid, okay? Uh, the traps that he has put before the people of God are so complex and so subtle that very often we don't even know that we have fallen into it. But the Bible says that for sure, Satan will always be working on the outside to oppose the work of God. The second thing that will happen is that other than Satan, of course, the entire world is fallen. And so the work of God will surely be opposed by the fallen world Jesus Christ said in John 15 verse 18, If the world hates you, keep in mind that he hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. So Jesus Christ is very clear that the world will hate you. Why? Because you don't belong to the world. And so the opposition from outside of the world will surely come in any ministry, and I use the word ministry very loosely, eh? it doesn't mean that the word ministry is only applicable to people like me who is in ministry. It's applicable to every single one of you. As I said to you when we started Exodus, you look at Moses, the deliverer of the people of Israel. You must know that you too are called to deliver your people, whoever it is that God has put around you, to deliver them out of darkness as well. And so again, everything that happens to Moses and is applicable to Moses, largely also applicable to us. And so the world will hate you because you belong to Jesus Christ and the world hated Jesus first. And let's go on then. And so what happened after the opposition from Pharaoh came? Verse 19 says, The four men of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily tasks each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they then said to Moses and Aaron, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a sting in the sight of Pharaoh and his servant and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. We talk about opposition from outside. Here, you have an opposition from, oh, this is, the top is wrong. It should be opposition from inside. The opposition from outside is clear. Satan is always at work. The fallen world is always at work. But here, God's word will often be opposed, not only from the outside, but from the inside as well. 
because there will be immature Christians who too will fall into the devil's trap as well. And more frightening among them all would be the fact that there are many fake Christians who are mixed in the ministry. And again, the ministry doesn't mean the church as well in your entire life. So in your lifetime then, as Christians, as you walk the journey of faith, you will have opposition from the outside and also from the inside sources within the church itself. I think any single person who has been involved in church ministry know that this is true. That there are so many difficulties sometimes in doing church work. That is not all a smooth journey. Oftentimes there are quarrels and difficulties and People use the word politics and all that kind of thing in church. So some people say, ah, I don't do anything with church because it's just very political, a lot of hypocrites. I have some understanding and empathy towards that as well. And the second one, the fake Christian mix into the ministry especially is very true. That among all the teachings of Jesus Christ, one of which frightens me a lot is the parable of the weeds in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus Christ said, he put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sow good seeds in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servant of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? Now, weeds and wheat look exactly the same, you know, almost uh, exactly the same. Even their fruit look sort of the same. Verse 28, And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? Do you want us to gather up all the fake Christians among the church and get rid of them? Verse 29, But he said no. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat among them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my bun. And so, this parable frightens me because of a sense of futility almost. That when the servant tell the master, look here, you know, my church, huh? wow, there are a lot of people in there who are not very really. You know, they, they, they just create a mess for us. We don't even know whether they are real Christians or not. And by the way, uh, I'm not talking about just normal Christians. I uh, in, include pastors and what have you, you know. So, so what to do or not? Should we go out and root them out and kick them out and, and go and get rid of them so that our journey will be smoother? And the last answer was very surprising. He says, no. You don't do anything because less in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. And this is very difficult to understand. You know, what does that mean? If I go against people who are fake Christians, you are saying that then the real Christians will be disturbed and, and get disillusioned or whatever it is. How does it actually work? And the Lord said, let them both grow together. Therefore, we know that from opposition from inside, not outside, from inside, God will work his work will often be opposed by immature Christians falling into Satan's trap, fake Christian mixed in the ministry. Parable of the weeds in Matthew 13 tell us that the weed will always be among the weeds until the day of harvest. And this is a difficult lesson. That forever and ever, until Jesus Christ will come again, the church of Jesus Christ will have many people who will oppose his work from inside and create obstacles and make the journey difficult. And so therefore, for people like us, for people like you, as we begin our journey of faith, in the meantime, before we reach sanctification, we will face opposition from outside and we will face opposition from within the church itself as well. So what did Moses do? What was his response? The Bible tells us that Moses then turned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you done evil to these people. Why do you even send me in the first place? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to his people and you have not delivered your people at all. So here we see that Moses actually expected instantaneous success. I mean, I can understand, like, you know, you give me this sign, I can make snake out of the stick, I can make leprous hand, magic show and all that, and I have so much power, and Aaron comes with me, and people are all supporting me. 
And now Pharaoh is against me from the outside and my own people also against me from the inside. And so, you know, it's a deeply disappointed thing. And he thought that he would have success immediately. But we note that Moses was very, very honest with God. Very honest. But we must also note that he was spiritually immature in his response to God. As we read Exodus further, going down the line, we will see Moses growing spiritually. And towards the end of Exodus, you will find that his demeanor and his response to God completely changed. A lot more mature. But that takes many, many years. So is the case for us all. And so I will encourage you to always go to God with full honesty. He knows anyway. And uh, know that by talking to God this way, why did you ever send me in Hokkien in Boto You know, like, mm, never give God any face. Uh. And attitude is definitely wrong, that I can say. But you see that God was tolerant to him. So it would be the case for us all as well. So you go to God and you cry out to him and you tell God, you pour out your heart to him because he knows it already. And it is a right thing to do. And it is part of our growth in our sanctification process as well. And so when we put it all together then, all of us who have believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, as I said, is moving towards sanctification. And so this is the meantime as we move towards being sanctified before our Lord Jesus Christ. What are some of the couple of important lesson points from Exodus chapter 5? The first thing I think is most important is that you must accept that opposition from without and within must be part of the journey of sanctification and ministry. And if you ask me what is the most important part of this sermon, I say this point is the most important point. This is because a lot of us don't quite get it. And we don't quite get it because we either don't know the Bible well or we have been taught about Christianity in a manner that is very different. This understanding the opposition from without and within is completely consistent in the entire Bible. And one of the key verses that I've shown to you before is the Apostle Paul telling Peter, Timothy, Indeed, 2 Timothy 3.12, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is a hard saying in the Bible. And very few people remember this verse because, you know, it's a, such a terrible verse to remember. The Apostle Paul says, indeed. I love the word indeed, right? Indeed is a, means over em emphasis, absolutely, definitely, you know. I think I shared with you before. First time I, I, I got the impact of the word indeed was I was studying in Texas, right? And this Japanese guy, he spoke fluent English, you know. Wow, it's blah, 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 you know. So... I, I, I was trying to make friends. La, so I, I, I went to him and said, Wow, I, you could speak really good English. And he said, Indeed. <laughs> it's like, Wow, you know, the England is very cheap, uh, indeed. <laughs> so every time the word indeed appears, I, I, I pay careful attention. Paul says, Indeed, of course, absolutely. Every one of you who think that you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He didn't say may be persecuted. Or, or, or maybe you get persecuted. He used the word will be persecuted. And concurrent to that, verse 13 says, while well, evil people, imposter, people, all these horrible, weak people, they will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so the two things actually come together as a key, absolute, non-negotiable status in the Bible for all of us who launch into the journey of sanctification. But some of you sit down there and say, no, my life is very good. I never get persecuted in any way. The Bible is actually very clear about this. If you look at Luke chapter 9, for example, there are people come to follow Jesus Christ and say, hey, Lord, I want to follow you. If you if were asked, we would say, well, congratulations, thank you, come come to our church, our church, come to this place, that place. Jesus did not do that. Jesus said, you know what you're doing or not. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. Son of man has no place to lay his head. And then another guy said, hey, I want to follow you, but I must go back and bury my father. And Jesus said, you know, you hold on to the plow and you look back, you're not worthy to follow me. So the command of Jesus Christ to follow him is not so simple. The evangelist Paul Washer says that if there is no cause for you to follow Jesus Christ, if Christianity is, is has no cost to you, no problem. Christianity has no problem to you. It's because you have bought 
American Christianity. I thought it was quite fascinating. You, that's because you have bought, you have bought huh, American Christianity. You have bought an object called American Christianity. And Paul Washer, of course, Dr. Seven Tong loved him. Washer is right. The Americans are, are the ones who have branded Christianity that we are very familiar with today. A Christianity is very smooth, prosperous, make money, healthy, everything okay, very happy. You know, they talk about sin, no suffering, no difficulty, no opposition outside world. Everyone have, 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 have happy family. It's very American. Why the Americans are very good at marketing. So they can sell ice to the Eskimo, right? Very good at marketing. You know, I used to work for Apple Computer, and we used to talk about Steve Jobs, right? The guy will really die. <laughs> Steve Jobs is supposed to have a, a PDF around him. He called a PDF around him. Personal distortion field, one meter. It is said that if you enter into one meter of Steve Jobs' presence, he can sell you anything and you will buy it. <laughs> He's that good. Personal distortion field, because your, your whole perception gets distorted by him. He's that good a marketing person. And so, unfortunately, modern day Christianity is much of a product of really, Paul Washer is right, American involvement by putting marketing tactics into evangelism. So, we package Christianity in a way that is more appealing to you. La. I mean, we'll start off by telling you that opposition will surely come. Will you become a Christian? Not very likely, right? So, better tell you the good news first. Well, you come with eternal life, you've got peace. La. You sing Yesu, you turn Yong Sen, you believe in Jesus, you eternal life. All the good stuff. La. Come to church, la. we give you free things and all that, free food, free this, free that, free tuition for your children, or whatever. We use that kind of method to lure people in. But Bible clearly talk about opposition from without and within, not only from Moses, but certainly for us as well. Like Moses then, we need to turn to the Lord honestly and seek Him through His Word and His people. In your journey of life, when opposition comes then, do not be surprised. Know and accept that it is a mark that you are in the right position. Conversely, if in your journey of faith, nothing happened to you, mosquitoes don't even bite you, something is terribly wrong. So when you are stressed, when you are disappointed, when you find opposition in your journey, you turn to God the way Moses did. Honesty, it's all right. You can call out to God in an immature manner. God knows. And God will answer your question. And accept that there are no instantaneous, easy answers. From that point onwards, Moses and the delivery of deliverance of the Israelites took on many long journey. Later on, we will see all kinds of things happening before the people were finally released from Egypt. And that was just the beginning. And then there comes the long journey in the wilderness and so many more years to come. There are no instantaneous easy answers. Why did God allow the Israelites to suffer for 400 years? Why did God allow the Holocaust to happen? Why did God allow ISIS to slaughter all the Christians and cut their head off? Why did God allow Reverend Wang Yi, such a wonderful servant of God, to be arrested? And who knows what torture is he undergoing through right now, even as I preach. We accept that there are no easy answers. Remember, Jesus said, Let both the wheat and the wheat grow together until the harvest time. And then the Lord of the harvest will then make sure that everything is made right. In the meantime, then, it is true that oftentimes we find it very difficult to understand why suffering will come at such a grand scale, not only to many people in the world and oftentimes to ourselves as well. But in the midst of your suffering and difficulty, then whatever your suffering is, may I also conclude by telling you, always remember that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered much worse treatment than you did. This is biblically true. So in the midst of our journey in sanctification, there will be a lot of issues that come to our life for every one of us. And everyone is different, unique. Sometimes it's a health issue. Sometimes it's a finance issue. Sometimes it's a relationship issue that can really drive you up the wall, isn't it? It's very, very tough. But the Bible tells us that even in the midst of your greatest difficulty in your journey, you must always remember that your Lord Jesus Christ suffered much worse treatment than you did. And because of that, you are able to then put your hope and your faith in Him. The Christian writer Dorothy Sayer says this, God has Himself gone through the whole human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restriction of hard work and lack of money, 
to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. And so, as we think about our own difficulty in the journey of sanctification, even at the worst situation, remember that Jesus Christ had it much worse. And so, as we say that we are his followers then, then because our Lord has suffered more than us, much, much more than us, we then can have the confidence that he will be able to see us through. So at the end of the day, the example of Moses really reminds us that following Jesus Christ isn't an easy road. Moses did not have an easy road all the way till the day he died. But it is the only road that is really worth following. This is not to say that following Jesus Christ is joyless. As I said to you, joy marks the presence of the Holy Spirit. But it has a lot to do with the many definitions we have in life about what does it mean to be blessed. When you say that you are blessed, does that mean that everything is smooth sailing, then it's called blessed? The Bible says no. Blessings come in many, many different forms. And I believe that as we grow in our journey, like Moses, we will continue to grow more and more in our lot and be mature. So at the early stage of his ministry, Moses tell God, why do you even bother to send me? But towards the end of Exodus, you will see that the journey of life has brought maturity in Moses' life where he truly understood the purpose of God and was able to devote his life so much to God that he's truly known as a man of God. May we all have the same journey as well. May our journey start off immature as Moses did. May every single day of our life bring about more maturity and joy and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who has suffered much more than us. As we put our faith in Him, may He grant us the love, joy and peace that marks the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the word that has been preached. From the example of Moses, we see that all of us will embark on a journey of sanctification in our life with its many ups and downs, opposition from without an opposition from within as well. We ask, O oh God, that you help us to accept the fact that all of us who are determined to live a holy life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted with opposition from outside and from opposition even from people whom we thought are your people. Help us, O oh God, to stay calm and come to you and seek your face in all this. Not only that, Help us to understand that whatever it is that we are going through in our life, our Lord Jesus Christ has already gone through it. Whatever suffering and difficulties we have encountered, He understands. And so help us to always seek Him and be completely honest and completely open to You, O God, so that You may speak to us and we may hear Your voice. And in so doing, understand that we are called apart from the rest of the world and that we follow You because you are the only person that is worth following. When Jesus Christ asked the disciple, to whom are you going to follow? The apostle Peter says, O oh Lord, you alone have the eternal word of life. To whom shall we go? May we have this understanding as well. For Jesus Christ our Lord is the only one who has eternal word of life that will grant us a deliverance from the darkness in our own life and from the world as well so that we too not only are delivered, but we can deliver the people around us as well. Grant to us this understanding, so that our life will be an extraordinary one. Not only live for our own sake, but live for your name's sake. That when people look at us, they will recognize that Jesus is alive and real in our life, and give glory to the Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.